Welcome to Liquid Lunch. We are coming at you live. It's December 3rd. As you can see by the little red thing on screen, right, Sandra? Yes, we look see, so professional. It it's official. It's official. Yeah, so here we are. We've got a great show uh, lined up, and uh, uh, we were just uh, having a lot of fun. Uh, before we are in the show December? Started. We are yeah. in December. We are in December. And what are you saying oh, about that? Oh, my God. Yeah. So. First of all, Christmas. What the heck? Where has the time gone? Second, 2014. It's just around the corner. 2014 is going to be a blockbuster year. Is it? It is. You said that before, but I why? Did. Because that's the year we all get sent to FEMA camps. Well, that's, right? that's no, that's the year we get all the coffins turned into cat shelters. You know, I was telling people about that. That's... About the cat shelters and the FEMA coffins. Yes, and I'm telling, it is exploding. We are getting so many cat shelters done. We are putting so many homes out there for the homeless cats. Yeah. So if we are kind to cats, we will mm. be kind to humans. Okay, right? that makes sense. 2014 is going to be an awesome, record-breaking blockbuster year. So if you're in, in fear, watch out. It's about time to release the fear. Right. Let it go. Okay. Um, by the way, remember last week we were talking, speaking about the, the, the FEMA camps mm -hmm. and stuff. Yes. With those labels. Remember I talked about the labels <gasps> they're putting on the, the postal box? Yes. Boxes? Yes. Well, I have some videos. If we want to see those, I don't know if we'll get to them. Because you were show. looking for them last week. We yeah, but find now them. they are ready to go wow. on today's show. Okay. And, uh, well, we were just talking with Sarah Calvert, our first guest. And, uh, Sarah, you said you had some friends in uh, Montana. I do have right? friends in Montana. They should check their mailboxes to see what color their FEMA stickers are. I shall pass you should on get them message. Because apparently if you get a red one, you're going to die what? on that day. Yeah. If you get a blue one, it means they're going to send you to a FEMA camp. If you get a yellow one, it means you're okay. You get to experience the rapture. <laughs> so all you have to do is buy a bunch of, go to Dollarama, get a bunch of those yellow ones, and just put it on your mailbox, yeah. and then they'll think they've already That's been there because right. they're not that smart. That is a right? good idea. Yeah. Fake FEMA stickers will sell <laughs> millions of them. Yeah. Right? That's what we can do. Yeah. And then, and then all of the, the staff of the FEMA camps are going to walk by there and say, oh, we already did this neighborhood. Exactly. We don't need to do it again. Yeah. Right? Good idea. Awesome. Great idea. Brilliant. Good business idea. <laughs> so, okay. So but wait a we, second. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to catch up. But Sarah is a really amazing lady because she really is all about living in the moment. Okay, before we get to Sarah, okay. I okay. just want to say who else we got coming on the okay. show. Because oh, okay. we have uh, Mitas here, Goran Mitic. We're going to talk about the boiling hot lava stars again. Well, you know which what? Is, I, the more I hear from Mita, the more I believe that he might be right. Also, we have uh, John Burling Hardy coming on. He's got a book called The Hidden Game Revealed, all about the Matrix. And yeah, he like was that. talking a little bit about it. It sounds fascinating. I know, so maybe we can get into that FEMA camp stuff with him a little bit. Also, Teresa Madeleine Long is here. Uh, she's got a book called Chronicles of the True Power of Female Friendships. Mm. And I know Jane wants to talk to her about that. Women power. And Frank Wilkes will be here. Frank Wilkes has got a new video, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna play it later in the show, and maybe okay. get Frank to perform as well. And uh, he's he he's made a career uh, of uh, he was actually in Buffalo Springfield. What? Yeah, he was in Buffalo Springfield. And he's here. He's coming here on the show. I today. guess you're oh. you're hanging around, eh, Sarah? That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, actually, he replaced wow. Neil Young when Neil Young left Bu Buffalo Springfield. Frank was his replacement. Wow, Dad yeah. would be so excited. Oh, it's very exciting. <laughs> so, Sarah, so welcome to the show. Welcome, it, Sarah. It's great Thank to have you. you back here. I know we had you on when Mita did his presentation here yeah. a couple weeks ago. Uh, you were the girl who did the song. It was the anti-gravity song. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That was beautiful. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. So I've already heard you, and I didn't even know that. <clears throat> oh, you saw that already? Yeah, yeah we watched it. I watched it with you. Oh, yeah. I was here that day. <laughs> <laughs> a part of you, anyway. So the hologram was here. Yeah, the hologram was here. Uh, anyway, Sarah, so great to have you here. And do, so you do singing, songwriting all the time, or no. do you, I mean, do you, is that your full time uh, gig? Uh, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. Um, it's always there's always a, an undercurrent. It's always there, but um, I do a lot of different other things. Yeah, um, I know. She yeah. lives in the moment. I try to do that <laughs> as much as I can. So, so you were just saying before we went on air, you were just saying that um, we were talking about you know living in the West End and the East End, and you said, yeah, I live in the West End until Sunday. Yes. Yeah. 
And then I said, where are you going? I don't know. Yeah. I think that's amazing, but you did say you're going away, right? Yeah, I mean, I know where I'm going. I'm getting on a plane on Sunday morning, so I know the next Step. six weeks. Where will that plane land? In Antigua. Whoa. Yeah. And do you know anything from that point? Do you know where you're staying in Antigua? Do you? Uh, a, fr a very good friend of mine lives there. Okay. So I will be staying with her, and she has set me up with some gigs and teaching. I'll be teaching yoga there and oh, helping with a sailing school. I used to teach sailing. So. I thought you were going skiing. That's after Antigua. Oh, okay. Yes. So after I don't think Antigua. you can ski in Antigua. Uh, water maybe ski. water. Water skiing, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, and then I'll be coming back to Toronto for a couple of weeks and then heading out west to BC. Wow. For a couple of months. And then I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So how do you do that? I mean, you're, uh, have you always lived like that, sort of uh, just doing one thing Ish. after another? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I, I used to teach high school. But even within that, I was moving around a lot, substitute teaching a lot, homeschool teaching wow. Wow. a lot. Wow. So even within that sort of structured career, I was very unstructured. So did you find yourself um, stressed because of it or not stressed because of it? Because of teaching? <laughs> I'm like, oh, stressed for sure. No, no, the <laughs> other aspect of the not, the, the, the aspect where you just didn't kind of know where you were going one way or the other. Uh, no, because opportunities, beautiful opportunities have always uh, presented themselves to me. So you're very much in alignment with just kind of following the next step and then wherever that next step leads. Yeah. Kind of instead of having to plan three years down the line, I'm just going to plan the foreseeable future, and then I'm just going to allow it to ha unfold whatever's what going to. And yeah. that might lead to making a plan for three years, but just thus far, that hasn't happened yet. Well, really, you know what? Even if you make a plan for three years, you can't really. Plans are only made so they can go off, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because really, all the planning for three years is really just planning the next step. Mm -hmm. Whatever the next step is, you can say, I'm planning for three years. Okay, so I have a goal in three years. How do I achieve that goal? Well, first I have to do this. And mm -hmm. really, that's all you're doing yeah. is the first step. Yeah. Because the next step will be, could very likely be off yeah. to what you thought it would be. Totally. Yeah, so my you really can't plan ten steps you ahead of you. Plan. Yeah. You can't. It's really impossible too many variables right I mean even weather there's just too many variables you can't you even people who plan to come in the States to go for Thanksgiving a lot of people couldn't go mm -hmm. because of the weather meanwhile they plan months ahead right yeah. now that creates stress it does now Sarah you're gonna do some songs for us I am how many songs do you want to do for us today maybe I'll do um, I'd love to do two uh, sort of singer-songwriter tunes and then just a little bit of a chant. I do, I teach Ooh. kundalini yoga. Ooh. And then I'll just finish with, I mean, the chants could go on for hours. So it's like, I'll just do maybe wow. a couple of minutes, a, a minute maybe, just so you can hear wow, what nice. uh, mantra sounds like. Okay, cool. Okay. Do you want to do a song for us now? I would love to. And these are original songs, These right? are original tunes, yeah. So this, um, hmm, which one? I'll do this one first. This one, uh, I wrote while I was in India. I was there for several months teaching yoga. And uh, I, I was. I think you'd be learning yoga in India. Oh, both. But you're teaching. But my purpose to <laughs> go there. She must be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange, but it was, it was beautiful. Um, so I went to an Osho ashram up <gasps> in the north. Wow. And I skipped a meditation to write this song. You mean the bag ones? You skipped a meditation. I skipped a meditation. To write this, this was my song. meditation. I was gonna say this. Yeah, good, good for you. This would be your and, meditation. And uh, it's just it's called All I Need. So.
much more to you, but I've got me two eyes to see the beauty of the starlit skies, and they can see the joy on a young child. wrong with that song? What's that? There's one thing wrong with that song. The wrong tempo, right? No, it's too short. <laughs> <laughs> I could funny. hear more. Well, you know, I, could hear, I could hear the full band, you know, really kicking into it. With yeah. Like In my mind, I'm hearing like Stevie Wonder-ish. Like, I'm hearing, Stevie like, that kind of nice. big, yes. with a lot of horns. I want to make people dance. Yeah, well, people could dance to that. Yeah, Def definitely. They kick it up. Definitely. Beautiful. Yeah, very groovy. Beautiful <laughs> lyrics. Yeah. Really nice story. A great vibe in the room here, too. Yeah. Like, do you have a CD out or anything with any of these songs out? I do. I have um, a couple. I have one uh, that is strictly mantra. So, again, Kundalini Yoga mantra. Yeah. Mantra. And then I have one that's singer-songwriter stuff, so there's 13 wow. tracks, and they're all original except for one, which is a bluesy version of Que Sera Sera that I do. And then wow. uh, I have a live album coming up. It was just finished being mixed last week, actually. Where did you record that? Uh, at Musidium. Musidium. Yeah, where's that? It <laughs> I'm not even going to pronounce that. I've only seen it written. I would Musidium. say Musidium. It's, um, yeah. It is at 401 Richmond, and it's a beautiful oh. store. Yeah, oh it's yeah. a beautiful, eclectic music store downtown, and they have great concerts, great sound. So um, I recorded an album there, and that will be, it's a project I'm working on, uh, a musical memoir. So it'll be a little book with the CD. So the book will sort of um, just describes where the songs came from mm -hmm. and how they came to be. Uh, you um, you sound so versatile, Sarah. If if you had one word to describe you or one sentence, mm. what would that be? Because you are so. I mean, clearly you're you're very spiritual, but you you have so many ways of expressing that. Mm. One sentence or a color. <laughs> oh, I hate those questions. I think I had a job interview. I think I got up and left. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to end this interview right now. She's just going to walk up and leave. No, um, you don't have to answer, but I just, I just felt like it because it's just felt life like lover. Asa. That would. That's wow, nice. that's, that's good. beautiful. Yeah. See, yeah. there we go. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> now, okay, so you're going to do a chant for us, but are you going to do another song for us as well? Yeah, I'll do. Um, I'll do a song that I wrote when I uh, got back from India. And it's called, kind of what I do, it's called Keep On Moving. So I actually just decided to move a few days ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you already booked the trip? Yeah, I had to book the trip, but I thought, okay, I'll come back to Toronto and then oh I'll man. figure it out. But then something yeah. else came up in BC. So I thought, I think it's just time for me to, to keep on moving. Wow. Yeah. I love that. So. This particular song, though, there's a balance between, I think, moving and staying still. Um, so I think it's good to be able to do both. Oh, well, I guess that I am destined to be lonely. And I guess that I am destined to be blue. And I guess I'll spend my days just remembering your face. And when the night time comes, I'll probably think of you. 
And I can feel this emptiness within my being. Yes, there's a hollow there that just will not be filled by the bourbon that I drink. The pleasant thoughts I try to think and I find it just gets worse when I sit still. And so I keep, I keep on moving even when I'm tired and I should really get some rest. Oh, I keep, I keep on moving. I hope the busyness will help me to forget. And I spend every single day watching the movies, try to lose myself in the technicolor dream. Study every actor's face, immerse myself in each new place, and make goddamn good and sure it's someplace that we've never been. And I spend every single night between the pages of a book about a man that I don't know. And he keeps me company, and I know that he won't leave. And when our time is done, I'll be the one who will go. Yes, I, I just keep on moving even when I am tired and I should really get some rest. Oh, I keep, I keep on moving. Well, I hope the busyness will help me to forget. Now that one's too short. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of my songs can go on and on and on. My well, like a mantra. Song, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lots of stories. I'm a big fan of you know, Gordon Lightfoot and his Troubadours. Oh yeah. Five hundred songs. For sure. So it's interesting how um, one line creates one line can create so much of an image for me. When you when you talked about the story and in, in, in between the pages. Mm -hmm. And this was your, you know, who keep the person who keeps you company. I was just, I was just going. I could, my imagination was just taking me to all kinds of romance novels and all kinds of. All yeah, of that's what, that's what you thought. Yeah. Oh, it was actually autobiography of a yogi I was oh. reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well well, but but no, you I see, love that. it can be so many different. Well, yeah. I mean, it could be a sci-fi. Mm -hmm. It could, and I don't even read no. Ro I mean, an autobiography of a yogi. That's far more a book I would read than that romance novel thing. But it was just because of the suggestion. Yeah that that's where it took me. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Wow. Okay. What were you thinking? You probably wasn't. I was blanking. Out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most He's meditating. Some dudes do when it comes to lyrics. I have a lot of musicians that I play with, and they have no idea what I'm saying. No. I have a dobro player that plays with me out west, and he never knows any of the lyrics that I'm saying. So okay. sometimes there was one show that I did in field, and I just sang. In field. Crazy lyrics just to see if he was listening. Like, oh yeah. Jared, are you listening? <laughs> he just was not at all. <laughs> 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 That's cute. Yeah. Good thing he doesn't do harmony with you, eh? Yes, that would be challenging. <laughs> that would be a problem. <laughs> so uh, we're just about out of time. We're going to hear the chant in a minute. But So you're embarking now on this uh, journey. You don't know where you're going to end up exactly. It <coughs> sounds kind of exciting. It is exciting. I mean, I have a little bit of structure in terms of... Um, this memoir that I'm working on. So, um, You're working on a memoir. What's that? The memoir. Yeah, it's a it's a memoir with the CD. So the oh CD, right. that's okay. the tracks have already been all recorded. Just needs to be mastered, um, and it's just production of the CDs and production of the book. So I'm doing a little Kickstarter campaign in January Beautiful. to try and get a little bit of support to get that off the ground. So I can do that from anywhere. That's all online. So wow. I might as well be doing it. Yeah. Near a beach. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> this We're is a girl who free. does not stress. <laughs> this is just beautiful. You don't Life stress. lover. Oh no, I stress sometimes. Do you? I do. It's a facade. Oh god. I do stress sometimes, but um, you I fake really it do well. try and I do try and go with the flow. Yeah. yeah. So this mantra that you're going to do for us. Mantra. 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 Yeah. What? <laughs> tell us about it and what can it do for us? Okay. Well, um, uh, a mantra. Sanskrit. So uh, it comes from the word man means mind, and then tra, or prang, means wave. So essentially, we're creating, when you do mantra, which is repetition of sound or a phrase like om, 
Mm -hmm. or you know, there's many, many different um, mantras in various different traditions. You're creating a, a wave with your mind and you can actually um, help to change what's going on in the brain, like from a, from a chemistry sort of way. I mean, they've done a lot of studies where they've hooked up different electrodes to, you know, nun and to whether whether it's Buddhist nuns or monks, and just to see the difference, what's going on in their brains. So I, you know, it's it's so interesting, and it, I, and, I, and from my personal experience, it's so true. Because mm -hmm. as I started to go more into spirituality, mm -hmm. I started to be attracted to Sanskrit music, oh. to a lot of that kind of music mm -hmm. and those kinds of chants. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't through anybody telling me; it was just I was just drawn to it. So mm -hmm. it tells you that you know it was just a natural step for me, mm -hmm. and um, I totally, totally get what you're saying because you do uh, even when i'm feeling down that's one yeah. of the things that i will listen to yeah. to help me to help trigger more positive yeah uh, it's it, i even have a cat named kimaya which stands for miracle oh, lovely. in sanskrit nice. so yeah so <laughs> so yeah it's just it's a tool that we can use right there's lots of different tools that we can use to make us feel better yeah. and uh this is a this wow, is a good beautiful. one beautiful so what's this mantra so this mantra is called Wayanti. Wayanti. Yeah, and it's um, it's a mantra that is used to um, help sort of invoke your intuition. Wow, beautiful. So it helps with intuition and it helps with uh, creativity. Wow. Will it help that with us if we just listen to it? Yes, yes it will. Okay, cool. Yeah. So Amazing. close your eyes Great. and listen. Should we try and say it too? You so can, you're okay. welcome to, um, okay. to join in if you fancy. Chanting really should be Kay. done. Vayanti, Kariyanti, Jagadura Pati, Aragindwaha, Brahma Dehi, Tresha Guru, Tawahe Guru. Vayanti, Kariyanti, Jagadura Pati Arigindu Maha Brahma Dehi Tresha Guru Itawa Ehi Guru Vahayanti Kariyanti Jagadura Pati Arigindu Maha Rama de Tresha Guru Itawahe Guru Itawahe Guru Itawahe Guru Wow. Wow, that was beautiful. You know, I wanted to play bass to that. It out. It's over there. Oh, I know. <laughs> if you weren't going away, she should do the Friday night jam, and you guys could do that, some of this stuff. That's that would a be really amazing. good, actually, little group of chords you got going on with that. So AGD <coughs> goodies. That's yeah. all you need. Three chords. That's all you need. Three chords and the truth. And the truth. Chords and what, the truth. Yeah, I went to yeah. a workshop, songwriting workshop, and uh, Amy Lou Harris was giving it. She said, "All you need is three chords and the truth Isn't to write that a beautiful phenomenal? song." That's probably the secret to life. Yeah. <laughs> All wow. of my fave songs that I love playing, like Neil Young, you know, early <coughs> stuff, a lot of them are just three chords. Yeah. And it's the melody and it's the lyrics. Well, the idea, too, is to affect the person who's listening. And if it's really complicated, it's hard for us to kind of catch it, right? Yeah. That, you could catch it right away. It was mm -hmm. the words that were a little tricky. <laughs> yeah, they're tricky. But you get it. I mean, you, you get it once, once we you get into repeat, it. Repeat Usually you it. chant for about 11 minutes. 11 wow, minutes is that's kind of beautiful. a magical number. So we did the Coles Notes version. Oh, is that going to be on your CD? Of chanting. That, that is on a CD that I have that's called Love and Light. Is that one your CD? Nice. Yeah. Now beautiful. can people get your CDs and stuff on your website? They can. Uh, the month to CD is available both on my website and uh, spiritvoyage.com. Okay. okay. And... Uh, the other CDs are available. Uh, my singer-songwriter CDs are available uh, okay, on my so website, and that's. Um, I know we have to go, mm -hmm. 
But I just want to mention, okay, Spirit Voyage. Mm -hmm. When some of the artists come here to tour, do you get to perform with them? Like I Sanat do. and Kaur or yeah, Mirabai um, Saibai? Yeah, I opened for Mirabai Saibai. Nice. Yes, they're oh, good, good I friends miss of mine. that. Yeah. Good. So I go to a lot of those festivals. Okay, and okay. Yeah. Wow. Great musicians. Oh, I mean, those experiences. That to me is, yeah. you, you are not watching people play for you, you are actually playing mm -hmm. with them. You, it's it's so infectious. It's yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. It really it really is. You're transported. Yeah, it's, it's very amazing. Powerful. It's very different than just going to a concert and watching a rock concert. It's an it's an absolute transforming experience. Yeah, you're you're a participant. In yes, experience. I oh, if every anybody gets a chance to go to one of those concerts, mm -hmm. they're amazing. Yeah, amazing. Okay, Sarah, thanks for doing this today. Thank you so I much for having me here. I got that sound going through my head. And uh, have a great trip, and uh, give us a shout when you get back to Toronto. I and shall love to have you back. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Nice to meet you. You too. So uh, we got Goran Mitic coming up right now. We're going to talk about boiling hot lava stars, and we got a video to uh, get us started. Before we is this the it post on. office video, the FEMA camp? No, this is the boiling hot lava stars. Oh, video. we're watching the video. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And then we'll come back. Sounds good. Tell me here, what is this? Just a couple of things that some... Oh, can, oh. can we do that later? Okay, we can do it later. Because okay, we got Mita on the show now. Okay, we we just Mita. saw that video. Mita wouldn't mind. We'll do it later. Okay, we'll do it later. Mita, so what is that video that we just saw? The, uh, what was uh, that? One of the very recent videos made by NASA, they captured the star which was ejecting the two big uh, jets of... Uh, hot gas yeah exactly from the opposite points like from the north and south, the pole. south pole and they just confirm what i'm talking about <gasps> exactly that's amazing yay how does that make you feel even better of course <laughs> they are not saying that that's that that, that, that the stars oh, are yeah, of course, hot of course. boiling lava which is the essence mm, yes. of your theory right because we are all told that the star that a star or the sun is a hot fusion reactor Yes, there's a still predominant, uh, you know, model and theory. Yeah. But uh, what we did 12 days ago here in this very studio, we launched the uh, epic public debate. Yes. Hollow boiling lava stars versus dark matter. Yes, and we've got some graphics. We'll we'll try to bring these uh, graphics up uh, yeah. appropriately uh, during so the show. So this is really new epic uh, debate, which will last whatever it's needed to be. 150 days or 150 years, yeah. but... Uh, then you're living for another 150 years, Nita. Uh, not me, <laughs> but debate may live <laughs> 150 years. The debate lives depends, on. Depends how, uh, how much we are able to accept new things. That's always ecology problem. Until your theory is accepted as self-evident. Exactly. Right? What I'm talking about is self-evident. Yeah. So uh, now I'm spending uh, my time trying to get in contact with people, uh, reaching them through, you know, emails. Mm -hmm. And also I visit personally some people, like people from University of Toronto, Canadian uh, Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, CETA. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, inviting them personally, giving them I invitation, like these flyers, and putting on their boards. Yesterday I was uh, on CETA uh, to meet um, and Neil Turok, the director of the Perimeter Institute, inviting him to engage in debate. Uh, we were just talking about the Perimeter Institute this morning here at that yeah. channel. Yeah. Mm, Perimeter Institute is the top institution for theoretical physics. 
Yeah. And Mr. Neil Turok is the top guy. Yeah. So did you actually well speak to him, Nita? Did you actually speak yeah, to him? Yeah, just shortly and giving him, you know, invitation to enjoy to, to, to engage in this um, debate. But also I have to challenge everybody, including uh, Perimeter Institute and CETA and Institution of uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics and yeah. Department of Physics and here in CETA? Toronto and uh, Canadian uh, Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Okay, CETA. So okay. these are people who are, you know, really in position to to debate about this and to hmm. my own statement and debate challenging everything we assume now, like a, like a knowledge about the universe. So I'm bringing up uh, my own discoveries and realizations that universe is uh, hollow boiling lava. We don't need uh, dark matter. We don't need dark energy. We are coming back to the simple, logical, and obvious universe. Mm -hmm. And that's the strength of, the, um, of the my approach and, let's say, my model, not mm -hmm. just theory, but model of universe. And uh, what we are coming up, uh, what NASA coming up with the videos and all the photos, we will see some other photos, just go same direction to prove that what I'm talking about is obvious. We see that. We just don't understand what we see. Yeah. So y your theory says that the sun, which when you see it, it looks like it's boiling magma. And you're saying it actually is yes, boiling magma. Yes, looks like because it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we are just the drops, you know, from the planets are big drops from the, from the star. And asteroids, which are countless asteroids around, are just small yeah. drops from that. Yeah. It's interesting because um, your theory, you kind of had a Newton-like moment uh, where the apple dropped on his head, you were watching a fire and you mm. saw that the flames were going up. Yes. And this was your kind of breakthrough. Uh, yes, that was the, the one of the, the <laughs> biggest breakthrough moments when I was watching huge fire, like 10 meters high, and the realization came to me like a, like a striking of, of light. This is anti-gravity. Mm -hmm. And we were all, you know, watching apple falling down all the time, fires burning up all the time. And then at a certain moment, some people were, you know, chosen to understand something. Yeah. So as we understood uh, gravity a few centuries ago, now we are at the point to bring to the, to the picture anti-gravity. Right. And to realize that stars like boiling, hollow boiling lava creates energy by anti-gravity force. Yeah. And that force is actually responsible for faster and faster spreading on the universe. So we don't need dark matter and we don't need dark energy. We just have to realize what we are looking at. And we have plenty of proofs yeah. and photos and videos about what the sun is and what stars and galaxies looks like. Yeah. And basically the idea about the dark matter is that if we assume, like the people that believe in hot fusion, that the sun is made out of uh, hy hydrogen that's converting yeah, to helium, yeah. uh, then it'd be very light. And that if you look then at the universe and you measure uh, all of those stars and they're all made out of uh, hydrogen and helium, then the universe is very light, but we know that it's, there's more matter than that. So therefore, yes. we call that dark matter. But it's just a con concept. There's yes. no such thing as dark matter necessarily. It's just a concept. And your theory solves that problem by yes. saying that the sun is actually made out of rock. Therefore, it's much heavier than... But hollow. But hollow. That's the, that's yeah. it, that's it, the it, trick I hollow, needed 16 then. years. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's the is hollow. it heavy then, if it's hollow? Well, it's, 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 it's less heavier than, than if it is full body of, of liquid stone, liquid yeah. rock. Okay. Yeah. So Which and then it comes to the to the hundred percent of the matter we need to see, you know, to to realize in order to to explain how galaxies can rotate with such a speed and not fly away. So observing galaxies and seeing that they rotate too fast, and according to all our knowledge, if we calculate, you know, gravitational interaction and uh, centrifugal force will fly apart the stars, but they stay together. So then came idea like 80 years ago, that must be something hidden. Yeah. But we don't need anything hidden. We don't need dark matter. We don't need mm -hmm. dark energy. We just have, we miss something very obvious, yeah. which is what we see everywhere around, rocks. So, so 
how could we miss something that is so obvious? Years and years of great minds. We always miss obvious things. That's the easiest thing to, to miss. Why there is saying, you know, if you want to hide something, you're put in right. almost obvious place. <laughs> well, plus it's the hardest place to see when it is totally obvious. Because we're too smart. We won't see what's yes, right in front of we us. We always believe that it's somewhere hidden and then we look somewhere else. <laughs> and it's right in front. It's right in front of you. Yeah, Instead it's very, of plain very sight. true. Yeah, very that's, very that's a psychology, psychology problem. Yeah. Well, also, the, I think it's interesting that because I've heard the criticism that physics and astronomy got hijacked by mathematicians in the early part of the 20th century. So instead of, yes. instead of uh, astronomers and instead of basing theories based on observation, it was really just mathematicians who weren't even looking, who were just uh, doing calculations all abstract in the head. They were not based on observation. Uh, mm -hmm. We are familiar with many v video games which are created now with the uh, you know, age of computers. But math was one of the video games, let's say, mind games created long ago. Mm -hmm. It's the game. It fits with some, uh, to the some level with the reality. Yes, yes. When we do something, measure something, cut something, building something, that can work. But if we believe that math can explain us the secrets of the universe, and secret of life and everything mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. consciousness, that's just simply impossible. Math doesn't have capacity. But there is so many people which so strongly believe that math can give us but wait a second. That ultimate goal. Uh, how, how about, what is your spin or your take on sacred geometry and the Fibonacci and all of that stuff? Isn't there that based is, on math? There is. There is the things which works. Okay. And there is the, the, the level until, you know, we can rely on math. But okay. to go I with see. our equations which we made some time ago and believe that that equation can bring us to the ultimate knowledge about the universe and who we right. are. And We're limited. It's okay. That's absolutely yeah. impossible thing to do by, by, by math. Right. So, and I see yesterday I was uh, on uh, University of Toronto, uh, Canadian uh, Institute for Astrophysics to meet uh, Mr. Um, Neil Turok, uh, director of Perimeter Institute. Uh, he was giving the lecture about the uh, quantum tunneling and uh, effects on cosmology, his own approach. And it was very well done mathematically. Mm -hmm. But uh, like a student of Stephen Hawking, they're biggest and best players in that realm of math. But they have to understand that it is just a game. Yes, they're we limited. We cannot get to the, to the point. And I heard from him that mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Weinberg, uh, Weinberg uh, recently was on TV saying that this is the end of the physics because if we go to multiverse option where can exist multi universes with different physics in every of them then yes. that's the end of the physics so we went very very deep in the wrong way and we have to get back to the simplicity logic and what is obvious and i am just going that way i'm so talking do you about call simple this physics? logical do you call this physics then? What do you call what you're doing then? If, if we're done with physics, what are you talking about? Would this be classified as physics in your opinion? Uh, my, my book is titled uh, The Introduction into New Physics. New Physics. But we okay. still call new physics physics, which is, which is century old. Okay. We still call that physics new physics. But then this is like a brand, brand new physics. But Mita, are you hmm. going, are you exploring or starting to go into consciousness? Are you starting to try, is this theory moving towards consciousness, understanding consciousness? We have to go there, definitely, and we will get there, but this is just a beginning to, to start okay. dealing with, to, to take out, to take ourselves out of the game. We are like a kids playing with the computers, with the game, so involved in that game and so so in love with that game that we forget to eat we don't mm -hmm. want to, mm -hmm. to 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 drink any even water and anything else and even when parents call us you know oh, come to eat or come to you know, worship whatever we are so dragged into that game that we cannot escape the game right so this right. is like a wake up call and right. wake up moment okay please people we are in the game we have to come to reality and reality is something very simple logic and obvious so can this change Understanding this new theory, okay, let's say people are saying, oh, you know, Mita, you have a point here. Well, let's explore this further. How can this change our day-to-day -day life? Will this change the way we look at medicine? Will this change the way, obviously, it'll change the way we look at physics, but will it, how can this affect our everyday life to a layperson like myself? 
for majority of people, this may not have mean a difference nothing, at all. You okay. know, but okay. for Fair for enough. for other other like, let's say small group will mean something, and for some people will mean everything. Okay, got but it. But the point is that. Uh, when we understand that we, we didn't get such a obvious things like what the sun is and we can see and we didn't realize our planet and what is very, very, you know, hand touchable thing, you know, to see that what the material common in on our planet, then we have to to question everything mm -hmm. we assume that yes. we know. Yes, yes. So if we didn't get such a obvious things, what else we did miss? So things like for instance if we understand the way we understand now, we understand environmental damage or the thinning of the ozone layer and things like that. If we have a new theory, would that change how we see the ozone layer and things and maybe how we would approach? We have to to exit the game. We enter, you know, with the science, which is too much thinking and too much math and to come to something simple, logic, obvious to change the way how we acquire our knowledge, to change the way mm -hmm. how we learn. And that will be really profound changes. Yes, that, that would so affect our everyday just, life. Yes, then. of that course, would. but this is just the very beginning. Okay. We have to realize how, how that happened, that we again did the same mistake we were doing before. So we have a uh, <coughs> repetition of same mistakes. Right. We, we look and we always, by thinking, come to the wrong conclusions. Okay. So something is wrong in that process. We have right. to, to really uh, research that very process and to come to some other process of acquiring knowledge because this one doesn't work. Well, I'll tell you, okay, one way that, that we could all be affected on mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day basis, Nita, and I'm going to bring it up. I know you might not want me to, but the fact is that your theory says that all celestial bodies are hollow. Yes. Right? With openings at the North and the South Pole. Here we go. Right? Yeah. Now, here we, here we, uh, you know, yeah, all okay. weekend long I was watching YouTube videos about Admiral Byrd and, you know, the hollow earth and the flying saucers and the secret UFO base in Antarctica. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, um, and, and if the earth really is hollow, I mean, that is a major change in the way we understand our earth, work. Not only all planets are hollow. Yeah. Only s very, very small planets, uh, planetoids and, and asteroids, they can be full rock without any hollow. But all big planets, including Earth-sized planets, and of course stars are hollow. Yeah. That, that's the, that's the, I have explained, you know, what is the physics behind, because it is rotation uh, together of liquid and gas, and it always create hollow inside. Simple physics. Explained already, you know, in my presentation in OISI this summer, and also 12 days ago on, you know, launching mm -hmm. debate here in, in the mm -hmm. Dutch Channel studio. So, so uh, basically, I'm inviting people to come here to, s you know, sit or stay in front of cameras to take the mic. I, mic is open, and let's debate about this. So uh, I'm challenging everything we, we know, and everybody is free to challenge me. Yes. I already got few very good questions, mm -hmm. and I did answer very very well them, and people were satisfied with my answers. So how so to that point, these. Um, so-called experts in, in physics that you speak to, how are they receiving this? How are the, uh, you know, the academics? Uh, the, the problem is psychology. It's okay. not the physics. Okay. It's a uh, psychology mm -hmm. problem that we are always ready for small changes, but we never been, and th that's a psychology, we are it's never ready for big changes, yeah. that everything what we believe can be wrong. That's right. That's, that's the psychology that problem. We are not ready to accept that. That's, so, that's why so, we so always true. get in, into. F that's why arguments get started. That's, that's why, why start you gets shouldn't started. talk about oh, yeah, politics or religion because the hardest thing for anybody to change is their worldview, right? Yes. Yeah, but what I'm talking about is obvious. So I'm talking about the things which can be very clearly seen now. So you're, what you're saying is, if they are open, with no judgment then it would be it would be far more um, easy to have that discussion but yes but uh, this is this this moment of, of, of discussion is like uh, uh, you are trying to wake up somebody who is sleeping yeah and nobody but likes to be to be woke up nobody right. but when you wake up oh you say oh my god this is even better than my dream but wow. when you are in a dream when you are sleeping you don't like when somebody trying to to disturb your dream right right mm. 
So this is wow. the moment of wake up and I know that they are getting disturbed, <laughs> but that's the way how we, we have to go. Yeah. That's the way we have to wake up and this is not pleasant period. But I hope that we'll try at least short. Well, we're using this mm -hmm. new media to get the debate going, right? It, it's a conversation and people can yes. investigate. And if people are still a little unsure about what we're talking about, of course, they can check out the video that we recorded here of yes. your presentation 12 days ago. They can go YouTube and just type hollow boiling lava stars versus dark matter. Yeah. And video will appear. It's uh, so far, video is already online like eight or nine days. Okay. Yeah. And I, when I started to, to spread information to, to scientists and professor, university professor around the world, so far there is 180 views. Yeah. For the video, which is two and some more minutes, two hours and a few minutes long, that's, yeah. that's the huge, huge success. Because people, we are you know, bored after three minutes. Yeah. We don't want to, to, to watch long videos. And for two hour video to watch, that's... How do you know they're watching visible. the whole video though, Mita? I cannot say that they did watch the whole video, mm -hmm. but at least they started to, to watch the video. Mm -hmm. At least they yeah. heard Sarah's song, and Sarah's song give everything what is needed to hear. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, they can engage in, in watching the video. But song is very important. Yeah. And I hope that people will soon yes, have we a should mention real that video, <laughs> video spot about music. We should video. mention that Sarah, the beautifully talented lady that was here just a minute ago, actually sang at your, your, um, your talk. And yes. she actually wrote a song yes. in honor of the talk and, and of your work. I am so really very amazing. pleased with the, with, the, with the song, and I was really, you know, made, oh my God, this it is great song. It was beautiful, beautiful. Well, you know what we're going to do, so. actually? Now she has to do the mantra. Mantra. We have to come up with a mantra for, for, uh, for this. <laughs> okay, this is, you know, Sanskrit That's mantra. That's your next assignment, I'm coming Sarah. with a new scientific <laughs> mantra. Pe people have to, yes, to sing <laughs> anti gravity song to, to get awake from the dream. Yes, there we go. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to, in the edited version, mm -hmm. we're going to put the song in. And, uh, nice, that's maybe, a great maybe idea. Maybe we'll put in the video because we're going to make the video, right? Nita? That's a great idea. I don't know how long that's going to take, but maybe we'll put the video in, in yeah. the show yeah. that we're going to create, and that'll give people a really good taste about exactly what we're talking about. I expect a song to catch even more people to, to you know, hear about uh, this model of the universe, and uh, then they will Might go watch and, and the see video. the video, yeah. you know, the, 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 the debate, start of the debate. Yeah. And, you know, people prefer to listen to the music than to some, you know, somebody talking. Oh, you know what? I don't know if we've looked at those other graphics before we wrap up here. Do you want to just bring those graphics up and we, we can... We can shortly go to, to graphics, just shortly. There's one there. Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. can see it over this there. Is the, this is the one of the latest discoveries. Uh, this is our galaxy and uh, we have discovered there is two big bubbles up and down. Uh -huh. We call them galactic bubbles and they just exactly confirm what I'm talking about, that mother star of the galaxy, hollow, boiling, big, huge stars, ejecting gases up and down, creating these bubbles. Mother star of the galaxy is also hollow, boiling, lava. Now that star. just gave me a question, because you know how in what we call conventional physics, when the gravity gets, when the, when the mass of a star gets so big that the gravity pulls it into a, a, a singularity, wouldn't the, according to our math, the giant star at the center of the galaxy be, through Black gravity, hole? pulled into a singularity? Because it's even more that, that, mass than a, than a okay, hydrogen but, star. But that can happen only in theory, which doesn't have anti-gravity force. What I'm bringing to the table is anti-gravity force, which okay you know, mm. exist like all the forces are repulsive attractive. So gravity has anti-gravity. So matter is protected from self-decay uh, with the gravity and self-destruction okay. okay. with anti-gravity. Okay. So okay. that's good enough for me, Mita. There and is no black holes. Okay, no black holes. What's this picture? And okay. Yeah. And this is another great photo which I, which I got from the, um, Thierry de Mess from, from Belgium. And he was asking me to explain this photo. This photo is also taken by, by, by I believe, Hubble and shows two exact uh, rings, symmetrical, and the small ring around close to the, to the star. Mm -hmm. So my explanation is this, these big rings, which are symmetrical, yeah. you know, left and right, are created 
actual explosion. This, this photo actually shows uh, initial explosion of the star opening the process of pulsating. And two huge explosions were on the north and south pole simultaneously. They're like uh, wow. smoke rings almost. Yeah, they, the same, they, same yeah. basic physics. The, oh. big, the big rings of, of uh, lava was ejected and they created big rings. But yes. then what happened? Uh, on the north and south pole, because of explosion, were created two tsunamis running ah. toward the equator. When they hit each other on equator, they created smaller ring which had enough speed to stay in orbit and become the small ring rotating around the star. Wow, they look like stargates to me. And Thierry was really pleased with my answer. And I was really pleased with understanding that actually I didn't see that, that photo before. So That's you cool. were in very in the moment. So far, I was able to answer the questions, tough questions. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that there will be no question which I cannot right away answer, but that's the process. Very cool. Okay, Mita, wow. so um, people can go to your website. Uh, what is it, thenewphysics.com? Thenewphysics.com, they can download book and read for free, but uh, please watch the video we made here in, in the studio. Is that also on your website? Just so no, no, no. You no, should no. put it on your website. Uh, I'm not that skilled. Come on, it's just some embedded <laughs> okay, code. He's, he's coming up with this whole new theory. <laughs> and watch the debate. He's, no, no, no. He's coming and up with this debate. And engage in this debate. Okay, let's bring that graphic up, it, please. It's, it's uh, the, so funny, me, that you are, you're coming up with this. You're rocking the world with this whole new theory, and you're not that skilled to load the video onto your website. Well, he's a physicist, <laughs> not a web developer. I'm not crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what, it's so funny how that works. Okay. I'm uh, good in some things, but... Not in everything. Okay, Mita, well, I'll... I'll, I'll Computers, I'll, I leave to the other people. I'll, I'll try websites. and give you some tips on how to do that. So the newphysics.com, and people can see the, uh, the video uh, in our archives where they just go to YouTube and type in boiling or ho uh, hollow boiling lava stars and Versus they'll get dark it, right? Matter, Versus dark matter. And they will get the video and oh. then they can watch uh, my presentation here in, in this very studio 12 days okay. ago and they will have full and necessary information to see what I'm talking about. Are okay. you planning to do another public debate? Yes, this is just a, this was just a beginning and hopefully end of, the, of this month we okay. will have another one. Uh, okay. Hopefully with some tough guys coming to you know, ridicule it or to fight with it or to accept it like self-evident. Okay, all right, Mita. Great to do Thank this you. again. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank for you for doing me. this. So we're going to play the song by Sarah, at least in the edited version. And we're going to then play a little thing from DJO. I love DJO. That's number two. Uh, let's do that. And then we're going to come back with uh, uh, John Burling Hardy and talk about the hidden game revealed secrets of the Matrix, which this is going to kind of springboard us yes. into right now. So we'll be right back with John. Well, here's a little tune with some new revelation that'll change everything we know. Well, it's the kind of thing that'll cause a sensation from Tokyo to Toronto. Way back in the days, they thought the world was flat. Till someone dared to say, there's a problem with that. The truth lies not in thought but lies in what is found and with new discovery we learned the world was round revelation revolution had to change the way we thought revelation revolution change the things we taught feel free to you know if you want to clap or dance or anything like that you know We now know the star's illusion Thought they were just made up of gas Creating energy by fusion But Mita's got a brand new concept to grasp Sun and stars, liquid boiling lava There's no dark matter you see sun and stars create their energy with anti-gravity anti-gravity is just dark energy 
We once thought the planet Earth was the center of it all Till Copernicus and Galileo made that theory fall Now that we can't see the sun, it's very plain to see That fire's true phenomenon is anti-gravity Revelation, revolution, have to change the way we thought Revelation, revolution, and change the things we taught we now know that stars illusion Thought they were just made up of gas Creating energy by fusion But Nita's got a brand new concept to grasp Sun and stars, liquid boiling lava There's no dark matter you see the sun and stars create air energy with anti-gravity and anti-gravity is just dark energy all the stars are pulsing and they're hollow at their core the planets too are hollow and are you ready to hear more? Are you ready to hear more people? That is the audience partition, participation. <laughs> the sun is not the mass of incandescent gas. The sun is not the mass of incandescent gas. We now know the star's illusion thought they were just made up of gas creating energy by fusion Nita's got a brand new concept to grasp sun and stars liquid boiling lava there's no dark matter you see sun and stars Create air energy with anti-gravity Anti-gravity is just dark energy Thank you. Am I supposed to believe these buildings just fell with no explosions? Mm -mm -mm -mm. I can't believe that shit. So how does fire pulverize three buildings? It doesn't, but who cares? They got their oil pipeline through Afghanistan. That's true. Because of oil, a few of us got wiped out. America's getting crazy. Mm, Patriot Act, wiretapping, torture. Unprotected borders, undeclared wars. Abu Ghraib. Guantanamo Bay. FEMA camps. Rex 84. And what will the ignorant masses say when World War III begins? Zeke Heil, probably. Ha! Ah, you know who's really responsible for all this? Dick Cheney and those neocons. You in? Ashcroft. And the Bilderbergs want their, uh, what do you call uh, it? Uh, New World Order. Yeah, that's it. Yep, 9-11 was no freaking accident. 9-11 was an inside job. In fact, what we have is a new Reichstag with a new enemy. Terrorism. It's really fascism. Everybody should know. Yep. The wars are fabricated. Hmm. <laughs> are you ready for Iran? Iran? Kaboom. And the media is useless. We get fear and fiction from morons. That's on a good day. <laughs> and if you can't trust the media, where do you get real information? YouTube. Infowars. Why don't you try to read a book? Hmm. Pick up five. All right, so we're back here on the show, and we've got uh, John Berlinghardy joining Hello, us. Hello, John. Hi. I, I know you didn't really see that thing, but it was sort of a, uh, just kind of, uh, uh, just talking about things like the New World Order and the, the situation that we're in, the, uh, the wars that we're getting in that we don't really want to get in. But Enslavement. We, we, we get into it anyway, and the FEMA camps and the... Uh, being the robots that, that we are in the matrix, yeah. right? Those robots. Yeah. Is that 
what you're talking about when you talk about the matrix and the hidden game that is being revealed? Yeah, I mean, I think though what might be a misconception is that things are really that different now. I think it's just a continuation of something that's been there for such a long time. It's just that it has different iterations. So okay. in each iteration, part of the kind of the hypnosis or the kind of magician's trick of the game is to make us always think that the subjective is paramount. So where we are, who we are, everything about our exact immediate present then just eclipses everything else which then eliminates perspective, which mm -hmm. creates the fog, and which keeps everyone in the game, essentially. So, okay, I'm confused. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I launched into the deep end of that story, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking, it's like, yeah, it's that. like almost like a next question. <laughs> sort of an interviewer's nightmare this year. So can Gosh. we make money off of this, John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, interesting, one can, because it really, it is about the human condition. So ultimately, the human condition is in some ways like a cuckoo clock. Okay. Where all the characters are on this huge, like, you know, you see in Prague, that major cuckoo clock there in the main square. Yeah. And you have all the characters, and each character is basically set up with their own skew, their tendency. Mm. So under certain conditions, set a certain way, each one of these characters will then predictably move in a certain sequence. And then it's like a complicated domino effect. And so all you have to do is just move the first domino, mm -hmm. just influence that first character, and then it just runs by itself. Um, for instance, wow. like Othello's, uh, like uh, Shakespeare's Othello, the character Iago, the little villain, is somebody who has no stature, is right at the bottom of the whole game, but he's able to create a little lie out of nothing, misapprehension from absolutely nothing, and that then brings down the whole game. And that's a clue as to how th the game really works. I mean, Shakespeare brilliantly displays okay. all of this. So what is this game? And who started it? And how do we... And why are you writing this book? Are we going to stop the them? Or do we just uh, go think, with it? Or what? Well, I think what happens is that the game, it's all around us. So that if you try to stop it, you are, it's almost like just trying to you know, sort of bite off your own head. You're, we're, we're so much a part of it that we have to, on one level, accept it just is. Having said that, I would say the way I picture the game is like this. Imagine that we have like deeper symmetries, which are described by things like uh, Fibonacci, mm -hmm. or like the Taoist uh, things. So these Can are. Can you the explain the Fibonacci? Well, let's say the, fi the Fibonacci, the, the, the Fibonacci uh, the pattern is, let's say, a sequence of numbers and you know, basically a pattern. Okay. And so that this pattern then repeats itself over and over again, we find it throughout nature. So it acts like a kind of building block, but it only becomes apparent at a certain magnification. Mm -hmm. On the surface, because of all the reiterations, because of all the complexity it's sort of repeated upon itself so many times, it is not visible, or it is visible but not discernible. Okay. Mm -hmm. But once you get beyond it, once you actually realize this pattern, then you start to see, okay, this is the building block upon which it's made. Mm -hmm. So you look at the flows in nature and there's a certain logic to it. But then when you come to the human realm, it just doesn't make sense. The, for instance, who's on top, the things we do, the wars, all these things make no biological sense. They don't make any kind of logic that can, is actually discernible in terms of furthering the species. No other species behaves like this, so completely irrational or apparently irrationally. Yet we think we're so logical. Uh, yeah, no, not at all. But we are logical within another context. And this okay. is what ends up happening, I believe. There is another structure. Okay. And this structure is the game. And it has another kind of basic kind of fractal structure, which is then superimposed on the base of nature. So in our subsection of the world, the human experience, we are within this realm. This game. This game. Realm. So an example of, let's say, the fractal of the game is that I call it, let's say, the circle within a square. So the, the circle ends up being the people who run the show, the people who are on top, people on the inside. The square then is the structure. So the way it evolves is that in human society, we always have a structure. Mm -hmm. That structure, let's say, starts off as a guideline then it moves to be a rule, then it turns into dogma, and then it starts to almost become like a, well, really beyond dogma, I mean kind of like sacred. 
And the key then is, once it starts to become increasingly rigid, this becomes the mechanism then that keeps everyone in place. Okay. So for instance, when we're talking about the dark matter, okay. when you think about it intuitively, when you look at Mita's analysis, it's so simple that it's self-evident, mm -hmm. as all brilliant things are. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we didn't see it? Well, in the same way that a magician, how is it that we do not see what the right hand is doing? It's because the magician's skill is in making us focus upon the left. Right. Okay. So when they came and said dark matter existed 80 years ago, the person who said it had enough clout. Mm -hmm. People around them had enough clout that eventually they create this sort of momentum of status behind it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then more and more, they then create complexity around it. Mm -hmm. From a false assumption, they'll build a whole bunch of you know, incredibly Baroque logic mm -hmm. that nobody or very few people will have the guts to actually challenge. Mm -hmm. And even those who do are usually going to be marginalized. Like the emperor's new clothes. Ultimately. Yeah. And essentially, the game works in creating false complexity. Mm. So is this, mm. is this done on purpose by the people that are the circle that you were talking about? In an interesting way, they're almost part of the game themselves. That they are compelled to act the way they act. Because they're protecting their... Exactly. It's, it's human Are they aware that they're in a game, even? Not... Well, interestingly, I would say that there's... The people who are on the inside are of a different psychological makeup, which really, you know... They're is born a, is, is a shot across the bow of standard psychology. Because... It, yeah, because in the sense that I would describe them as, let's say, this player mentality. Okay. And in my experience, I've never seen anybody who was not a player learn to be a player or anyone who was a player change from being a player. So I, think, I believe it to be an absolutely innate quality. And so just like musical talent, I mean, you can become better at it, a better musician, if you have the talent. But if you have no musical talent, it doesn't matter how much training you get. It's not going to make, make a big difference. You know, I just read something in a business magazine that kind of uh, says that exact point. And, and, and somebody made a quote that said, rich people, the, the very richest people, are different than you and me or different than everybody else. Because, not because, because they tend to keep accumulating wealth, right? And the point that they were making, uh, you know who said this? Peter uh, C. Newman actually said this in, in mm -hmm. some Canadian business magazine that they are just compelled to play the game and they just want to win, keep winning the game as a player, just as you described. Exactly, that's their metaphor. And so if you were to look in their own personal lives, they'd probably be just a total you know, train wreck because they would be taking exactly that kind of game player, zero sum game mentality towards their personal lives as well. So, so what makes them different? Why are they different? Are they born like that? Basically, like they're born in the, in the sense that, like an example, a um, normal person, let's say, functions on, say, reciprocity. Okay. I do something for you, you do something for me. There's a certain sense of obligation. When you'd be dealing with a player, if you're the player and I'm the drone, let's just say, I do something for you, your take now is that if I did that, then the next time you ask, I'll do something more. It's, okay. it's, it's just a fundamentally different way of thinking. And wow. it functions beautifully. Because even though on a moral sense, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's disgusting, uh, in terms of the practice of day-to-day -day social interaction, it's perfect. Because it somehow works on almost a kind of like flaw in human nature. Mm. That we're drawn to this, um, to status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so status then becomes the currency of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. yeah, it's... it's uh, so, so how did you get in involved in, in writing a book like this? Well, I mean, my original experience was that I was doing a turnaround of a company in Eastern Europe. And I was sent there to, it was right at the end of communism, sent there to basically uh, turn this huge paprika plant. The person before me hung themselves. The one before that died of mysterious circumstances. And when I got there, those who sent me in, which was the bank, all of a sudden, when I started to actually see what was going on, became very agitated. And then as it turned out, 
in a sense, it was like an Agatha Christie novel where everybody was in on it. Where the bank who literally took over the company, their representatives, as well as the entire senior management of the company were involved in this, essentially this massive fraud where they created a shadow plant where they were moving all the equipment and just funneling money. And I was there as a foreigner to essentially just keep this flow going. So you were being used as a pawn without oh, yeah. being known? Without being no, absolutely. And, okay. and what was interesting was that I thought that this was an anomaly. I thought, oh, this is the transition, Eastern Europe, communism, all that type of stuff. This is what you expect. And then I started to realize that that pattern of how it worked, the people who were on the inside, the specific techniques that they used to cover their tracks, I just started to realize when I got back here that it, basically it was the same. And not only mm -hmm. that, it, would, it was almost the same pattern over and over again. And it was exactly like um, mm -hmm. magician's tricks, which is in fact hypnotism. Hi all mm -hmm. hypnotism works on that. It's basic just misdirection. So is there, so now the book, The Hidden Game Revealed, like first of all, we're, we're stuck in this matrix. Right, we're we're here. Well, we are. We're, we're individuals. Not completely stuck. In oh, it, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. but here we are. We're individuals. We are trying to live our lives. We're trying to be happy, and yet, then we get imposed on by the macro world. You know, uh, the circle know, people. The government announces we're, we're going to go exactly. to war. The taxes keep going up. Uh, the economy takes a downturn, and we're stuck. And we have to, as individuals, deal with the problems. Uh, that are created from this this matrix that we're in. Like, is there a way out? And does your book point to that? Um, yes. I mean, ultimately, the way out is that the entire matrix is an abstraction. It's, it appeals to the mind. It takes us into the mind. It strengthens the mind. So what is the opposite of the mind, ultimately, is the heart. It's the one place you don't go to, and it's the last place you even think of in terms of countering this matrix. That typically what we end up doing in trying to counter it is go back into the mind, which actually just feeds it. Right, like come up with strategies or form exactly. a new political party or... So, in, interestingly, I think uh, Victor Hugo's book, uh, Les Miserables, um, and that incident of the random act of kindness mm -hmm. and the impact that it has and then, you know, the, on, not just on that individual, but the ramifications. In fact, he was an individual who mm. actually had intimate knowledge of the game. And I think that on a deeper level, what he was really s pointing to there was that this is the key um, to actually breaking the game. Moving to your heart. You Moving mean? to the heart and random acts of kindness in the end. And the point being, the mm. kindness obvious, but the randomness is that any th the moment you introduce any kind of linear structure to your activity, mm -hmm. you're now basically chopping the legs from the action itself. You're undermining the action. It now becomes self-conscious. It goes into <coughs> mind. It, goes, it essentially becomes consumed by the game. It's the randomness that the game cannot deal with. Because the, the game essentially is based on linearity, which in itself is just an illusion. So the ultimate way to actually confuse the game and to break the game is its randomness. And of course, randomness of what? Just kindness. So the mind can't handle it's non-linearity. It's that simple, ironically. So, so yeah. the mind can't handle non-linearity, so just get out of linear. Exactly. Like, it just that like, sounds for instance, very simple. <laughs> it's, no, but it's just like, for instance, the reaction of the, um, I don't know, was the commissioner or the, 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 uh, the, the inspector who's chasing uh, Valjean oh, there. Okay. Uh, the, you know, the, the escaped convict. He comes from linearity. He's talking about justice, linear. This was done, I have to execute justice. And then he's confronted eventually himself. He uh, comes up with the dilemma of the insanity of his own system. But ultimately what creates the, 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 the realization for him is when he comes up against just random kindness. Because mm. the system can't deal with it and the system is terrified of it. Because when there's acts like that, they, they have a very hard time organizing themselves to confront it. 
See, random acts mm. of terrorism is, is, in fact, the worst thing you can do, such as al-Qaeda, or whether it exists or not, is that what ends up happening is the system can say, oh my god, we've got random acts, now what we're going to do is we're going to clamp down everything. So it becomes a wonderful pretext to actually up the ante of the game. So that's what's happening though right so now. So do you exactly. think that that's, do and you, okay, and in so fact, maybe they're doing it to even feed the game but itself. But how do we break that, no, be really nice. break it? No, just be nice. Just exactly, it's the kindness. Not, you know, even, even the sit-in movement and things like that, I mean, it's all fine and nice, but once again, too organized. It's like literally the person just, like in a, an, an example, I guess, to point, make the point is, let's just say when you encounter um, a beggar, and the, in a sense, the price of entry to the transaction with the beggar is the coin that you give them, Okay. right? So nothing's going to happen unless you give them a coin. You know, good wishes won't work. However, once you give them the coin, a potential is created. If it's just the coin, that doesn't mean anything. But if after the coin is given, there is a real connection and a feeling of there but by the grace of God go I, and this person experiences that, then that is something that has happened and will be remembered by both. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not a giving and a taking, which is what mm -hmm. relationship is, it's a loop. And that's what creates the break. And once that's broken, one time it sets an example, it repeats itself. It becomes actually a kind of viral fractal that so breaks game the game itself. Of its own, really. It is the ultimate anti-game, okay. ironically. Anti -game. Yeah. All right, so here we are. We're living at a tenuous moment in yeah. history, as we always have. <laughs> right? In a sense, yeah. <laughs> you know, we could have a, We've upped uh, the ante again. We could have a nuclear war tomorrow, yeah. or we can uh, um, muddle along in a world where we could continue to live our lives and plan for the future and that sort of thing. Uh, which way is it going to go? I don't know and don't care. In the sense oh. that it doesn't matter. Because obviously, whatever is going to happen, happens. It's meant to. This world, you know, probably there were worlds before us. There'll be worlds after us. So what? Wouldn't you say it depends, where you go depends on you? Like, well, when he I mean, a up to a point. I mean, you know, in other words, if, if you're sitting, if, if there's a vicious dog in front of you, you might smile at it, but it'll still bite you. you not know, necessarily. You, no, not necessarily, but if he's hungry enough or angry enough, he might. Um, or, but, but you could also bite him. That's also a possibility. <laughs> that's right. And it's <laughs> the risk the dog is taking, no doubt. That's but, <laughs> yeah. but what I think is that, in a sense, what I mean by, I'm, you know, I don't mean to be flip with the answer to that. It's more to say is, what we have each moment of the time, e each moment you know, of the day, is an immediate moment. And when you're actually just simply in that place and, and making an act of kindness, uh, some act of generosity, it can even be just listening to someone, or there's a million different ways to do it, then we're doing, I think, as much good as we possibly could do, and that's all we can do individually. Mm -hmm. We can't and in fact, the best way for us to influence anybody else to do that is ultimately to do the same, just like yes. with our children. Yes. Mm -hmm. They get to watch what we do. You exactly. Wish to see, right? Oh, yeah. If we're kind to them, they'll pass it on. And if, if we talk about kindness and we're not kind, then they will talk about kindness. And not be kind. Yeah, exactly. Because they'll learn quickly. Makes sense. Well, I got to tell you, uh, John, I would love to keep this conversation mm -hmm. going. And I really want to read the book. Well, thank you. The Hidden Game Revealed. <laughs> And uh, if people are equally intrigued uh, just listening to this conversation, where can they go and get a copy of the book? Um, on Amazon. Okay, uh, so right the, what do they Amazon. look up there? Uh, it would be um, The Hidden Game Revealed and then uh, my, uh, my name, John Berling Hardy. Okay, all right, this is awesome. I would love to have you back sometime and carry this on. Well, I'd love to continue the conversation. Okay. Thank you very so, much. So, you know, here. before, are we going for a break? We're going to take a break. Okay, so before we go for a break, this is the perfect time to actually practice a random act of kindness. Let's mention a few really, really good things that we could do. So this weekend, there's something <laughs> called um, the Cat Shelter Bills at the Toronto Humane Society, where we're making the cat homes. Out of those FEMA coffins? Out of those FEMA coffins. Where did you get the FEMA coffins from? They're donated. Oh, okay. Okay, Good. so, so um, we're actually doing a cat shelter build. Where we're building the homes. It starts at 10 o'clock at the Toronto Humane Society. Um, is there a website that we can go to for the torontostreetcats.com, right? torontostreetcats.com. Toronto okay, what's this pig safe thing? And this pig safe fundraiser is about trying to reduce um, the number of animals slaughtered in slaughterhouses. So there's a, a big uh, pig safe fundraiser called Animals Beyond Borders. Yeah. It's happening uh, this, which day? Saturday. 
so Dece December 7th from 6 p.m. to 9.30 at uh, 34 Little Norway Crescent Lakeview Room. That's um, by Lakeshore and which is by where the slaughterhouse is, Bathurst wow. and Queen's Key. And there's going to be some vegan food, entertainment, and that kind of thing. But it's um, this woman, uh, oh, she is absolutely amazing. Her name is Anita, and uh, she has been doing this for many years. And what they do, talk about random after acts of kindness. You have a line of slaughter trucks going by. She has water, and she takes water bottles. And you can see the little snouts between the holes in the slaughter trucks. And she gives them water. So at least while they're waiting to be slaughtered, she actually practices uh, a random act of kindness right there from her heart. And, so, and that makes for better bacon. And that just, ouch. <laughs> Can we edit that part? <laughs> okay, so now I understand why thing. you are so in fear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, that's all happening this weekend. I guess Hugh's not gonna be there. <laughs> He, no, if you're there. there, can you please have a crew photo it? Because I, I really want proof. I feel for those little pigs. Are there little snouts sticking out of the truck? Well, hopefully you can give them some water. At least give them some water before you kill them and eat them. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, and, uh, we forgive and John, you. There's John, your random act of kindness right there. Do you have a right website as well? Uh, uh, um, just uh, my uh, email. Email. Okay. Well, so we this put that sounds up on the amazing. Thing, so. so the book is called The Hidden Game yeah. Revealed. Yeah. That's awesome. Right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Okay. So we're going to um, play this little. I'm going to play that FEMA camp thing. I'm just turning my back to you. Okay. Now. <laughs> uh, the uh, let's watch number uh, four. These are the dots on your mailbox. Check this out. Okay. And we're don't get just just be be nice to the man from the FEMA. <laughs> when he puts a, bl a red sticker on your mailbox. And we're going to come back with Teresa Madaleno Long right after this. <laughs> so I was reading this article that martial law is about to be declared this year or next year. People's mailboxes have a color-coded sticker on them. And the purpose of the color-coded sticker is to determine what category of citizen you fall into. I'm a good girl, I am. And so this morning I came out, looked at my mailbox to see if I had a color-coded sticker on it and there was a sticker on it. Say what? So let's go look at what the what there is on it and what there was actually. We have a yellow color code sticker which here's how the theory goes. Do tell. If you have a red sticker on your mailbox, the government has labeled you as a former veteran, a patriot, anti-Big Brother, against the New World Order. The theory always says at 4 a.m. on the date they declare martial law, at 4 a.m. they're going to come and kick your door in. The blue sticker says that you think like the red sticker people, but you're just a follower of the red sticker people. So you're in the second tier of patriot, not as big a threat. So you're going to be under house arrest and they're going to come get you and move you to the FEMA camps. Your papers are not in order. They're in order. Look at them again. It's red sticker, you die on the first night. Blue sticker, you're under house arrest till they move you to the FEMA camps. And then the yellow sticker means that you're a good, loyal, big government, Obama-type, New World Order supporter, and that you're going to go along to get along, and that you're going to be loyal and subject and take the mark of the beast and this and this and that. I mean, I kind of find it funny that I come out here and there's a yellow sticker on the mailbox, so that means our household is just going to go along to get along, take the mark of the beast, I suppose. So we'll avoid the guillotine, but on a side note, this blue sticker this morning was down there on the ground. next to the mailbox so either either we have been recategorized or we have friends in high office or something that came by and wanted to save us from the impending danger and I think it's kind of funny because I hate the federal government I'm actually right now carrying a 380 LCP I do have a concealed carry permit and I would figure that would trigger or register with the with the government 
And I commonly post that I can't stand the federal government taking away our freedoms, yada, yada, yada. And I don't see a color-coded sticker on my neighbor's mailbox. Anyways, I just thought it was funny that I would clearly, in my opinion, and I'm kind of pissed off, I would think I'd be in the red sticker camp. I've got three rifles right next to my bed. I always carry my 380 on my person. And apparently, at worst, I'm a blue sticker. But I guess, according to how the theory goes, we're safe and the government's going to leave us alone. So I just thought it was kind of cool. What are they going to do anyways? So we're kind of small potato up here. So who knows? Maybe I'll put the blue sticker back just so I can get a knock on the door when they declare martial law. Back here on the show and uh, as you can see, Sandra, the uh, FEMA stickers are real. And you probably got a red one on your mailbox. You know what? No, I think I'm going to get some points because I'm practicing kindness. Well, you're going to get a yellow sticker. I'm going to go with a dollar ammo and I'm buying all those yeah. yellow stickers. Well, we're going to go into business making fake theme stickers. <laughs> right? And we're going to put little happy faces and say we love you. Yeah. That's, That's what we're going to do. That might actually work. Yeah. Okay, we got uh, Teresa An Madeline. amazing lady. Teresa Madalena joining us and she's written this book right here. Right? The uh, Girl Power, Chronicles of the True Power of Female Re Friendships. And uh, Teresa, welcome. I know you've been on the show before though, yes, right? Yes, I have been on the show, but I, I, I'm really looking forward to today because last time I was here, Hugh, of course, I couldn't really say a whole lot because the book wasn't finished, it wasn't copywritten, and it was sort of the mystery book before. Yeah. So. Really? You mean it wasn't even written the last time? It it's wasn't been a long... even written. That was well, I was in months? the process of writing it, and you were asking me a lot of questions, and I was being very vague, and, <laughs> and you were getting a little frustrated, I think. And uh, so that's why I call it the mystery book. But now you can ask me anything, and I will answer. All right. Well, <laughs> as best were... I can. No, I can't remember the details of our last interview, but uh... I can't remember what he had for dinner yesterday. So that's don't okay. Take that neither person. can I. Neither can I. <laughs> But did That's because you... of the bacon you eat, by the way. I know. Yeah. A bacon I get that in there. No. Um, <laughs> the, uh, did, you even have, did you have the concept and the title? The I did time? have the concept and I had the title, but I would not even reveal the title to you. And is it, is it, it, it sounds like, it looks like a, a non-fiction book. It is a non-fiction book. Okay. And um, basically this book was born out of uh, one of my friendships. The inspiration came from the fact that I went through a very difficult period in my life about 10 years ago. And I had, um, I've always been surrounded by a great circle of female friends, but this one friend in particular went above and beyond at that difficult time in my life. And I wanted to do something for her wow. that wasn't so much material, because I always buy her gifts. You, anybody can go out and buy flowers or a scarf or jewelry for someone. But I wanted to do something for Janice that was really meaningful and showed her how much she meant to me. And I thought, what skill do I have that, that I can, and can, can do something with and show her how much she means to me and how much I appreciate our friendship. And wow. my background is as a writer, a professional writer, so I decided I was going to write a book. And then I thought, well, what the heck is this book going to be about? Mm -hmm. And naturally, uh, friendship. So that's how this, this idea was born. Wow. So, uh, I mean, who's the book for? Is it for women? Well. Initially, it was intended for women, yeah. but as I started to develop the stories, and what it essentially is, is it's seven stories about people who have incredible relationships with their female best friends, and they've helped them overcome overwhelming obstacles in their lives. And initially, when I started writing the book, Hugh, I thought that this would be strictly for females. However, I've had men read the book and they tell me that now that they've read some of the stories they're starting to understand why their wives and why their girlfriends mm. have to have coffee time with their girlfriends, hours on the phone with their girlfriends, or sometimes they just have to talk to their girlfriends and not their husbands about certain issues in their lives. So I think in some ways it, it's a good book for men to read as well. It sounds like a therapy kind of. Um, because they get to understand their wives better. It, it, I think it is in some ways. It, in, in some ways, I think it is. I think women get something out of this because they, it's something that they can relate to yes, in terms yes. of the relationships. Yes. But men also look at it and go, oh, well, that's why my wife goes shopping every Saturday with her girlfriend, or that's why my, my, my wife has to have regular coffee dates with, uh, wow. with her friend. 
But this for you personally is a tribute to your friend ship with Janice. Yes, it is. In fact, um, there is, I said there's seven stories in here. Yes. There's actually um, seven complete stories and then there's an eighth story which is three or four pages. Not so much a story about Janice and I, but a, a, a little uh, snippet into our relationship, what she means to me, how we met, um, how our relationship developed. So, so that readers look at this and they see that you know the book is dedicated to Janice, but who is this Janice? Mm -hmm. and, and they they figure that out near the end of wow. the book in a, in sort of an eighth story. She must have. So when she got this, she must have been blown away. She just actually found out the book was published three weeks ago, and a week ago I presented this to her um, because it just so happened that the book was published um, right around her birthday. Oh. Um, that mm. wasn't in the intention at all. It just kind of came together that way. I, the book huh. took four and a half years to put together, um, but um, I presented her to her, and um, shock would probably be the best way to describe her reaction. Mm. What a birthday gift. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. So, okay, so now I've known that there are some women that they don't necessarily have a, a lot or any close female friends. Maybe all their friends are guys. There are some women like that. Just like there's some guys mm -hmm. whose all their friends are women, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So what can this book do for those women? Or do they need any help at all because they've got <laughs> guy friends? Oh, so well, they don't need any help at all because they have male friends. I think that's an excellent <laughs> question um, because what I hope from this book is that it even though it's a tribute to Janice, it will also be inspirational to, to other women because oftentimes in life we forget or take our friendships for granted mm -hmm. and maybe we begin, we begin friendships with people, those friendships feel valuable to us but we let them slide, we mm -hmm. forget, we forget to pick up the phone and mm -hmm. I hope that some, some of these stories will remind women to pick up the phone and call that friend that they haven't talked to in a while, mm -hmm. and maybe they've developed friendships with men and they've forgotten about the ladies that they've met along the line that could mm -hmm. turn into val mm -hmm. really valuable friendships. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you bring up about some women being really good friends with men, I actually had um, a man and a woman approach me and say, I hear you're looking for people to be in your book. We have a really good relationship and we'd like to be in your book. Mm. And they had a fascinating story about their relationship, but I didn't put it in the book because all the other stories were about women. Mm -hmm. So um, actually my editor um, of the book, um, who is also an author, she's an author of um, several books, and in fact she's been on this show, Donna Kikange, mm -hmm. oh, she is Donna. trying to encourage me to write uh, a book about platonic relationships between men and women who are best friends. She thinks it would be a great follow-up to this book. That would be a good Yeah, that follow. sounds like a nice uh, yeah. next book. So, so, Teresa, you mentioned that you took other people's stories, correct? Yes. So how did you go about finding them? How did you, well, did you that, put an ad in the paper? Or? That, well, not quite, but pretty close to it. That was the difficult part. I said that it took me four and a half years mm -hmm. to, to put this book together. It took me six months to write it, but the four and a half years was trying to find people oh, who actually goodness. had unique and interesting stories and struggles to talk about. Um, one of the challenges that I had was a finding people who were willing to, uh, for lack of a, a better way of explaining it, spill their guts mm -hmm. because I had to ask them to tell me very personal things about their lives. Mm -hmm. I had the challenge of some people coming to me, oh I have the most fascinating relationship with my best friend and then you listen to their story and then you have to tell them I'm sorry but your story is a dime a dozen and tell them I'm sorry that you can't be in the book. So there was that sort of stumbling block. Um, wow. But, That's a tough, how did you handle that? Um, well, you know what, I, I, there was never a point where I said, no, your story is not good enough. It was always sort of like, I'll keep it under consideration. Right. Um, but then I just never put it in the book. Yeah. And well, uh, then I, mean, I gave people, sorry, oh. then I gave people at the back of the book an opportunity, um, there's a section called Friendship Tributes, where I took qu random quotes from people. Oh, beautiful. Um, saying, um, 
Thank you. Thank you to their friends. So, for example, there's one here that says, To Barbara from Karen, you are the sister that God just simply forgot to give me. I take a little bit of you with me every place I go. Thanks for being a true friend for the past 15 years. So I just gave peop different people that I knew from um, different organizations, friendships, community groups. Um, I just sent out an email blast and said, if you want to put a quote in my book to your best friend, please come forward. And some of these people are people who wanted to have their full stories told in the book but didn't make it into the book. So this was sort of the, oh, the opportunity for them to say mm -hmm. something about their best friend. But um, sorry, Sandra, I didn't really answer your question. I, I, I tweeted, I got in touch with, um, I'm in, in public relations, I got in touch with clients to ask them if they knew, knew of anybody who had stories. I asked people at the gym I belonged to, just about anybody I could come across. I asked, do you know anybody who has an interesting friendship story to tell? And that's how I, I found so people. So I know it took you four and a half years. How many stories did you get? Is that because it took you four and a half years to find the right ones? You, yes. But you were you got it a lot of them, I, or is because you couldn't get many? Well, I I couldn't get as many as I thought. Like I was naive because as a journalist, I always found it easy to interview people. Mm -hmm. So I I did go into this very naive, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have a flood of stories, I that. and I'm going to be able to pick and choose what I want. That wasn't the case. I wow. think you when I was here back. Uh, a few months ago, um, I only had uh, four stories mm -hmm. for the book, wow. and um, I needed more. And um, even Donna Kakange, my editor, kept saying, you need more, you need more, you need more, you need more. And I kept saying, I know this, I know this, but it's not so easy to find. Mm. Uh, but um, in the last few months, I lucked out, and I, I did find more. So um, uh, again, there's a total of seven, which doesn't sound sound like a lot but um but this is not they, a small book Teresa. it's not no it's not a, a small book because the stories in it are, qu are quite i think compelling um but um i did also have some stories that were really amazing but then when i got into the interview process and in some cases these interviews i interviewed people like 10 12 times mm -hmm. before okay. i completed their stories right, because right. in some cases they're telling me their whole life story mm. Because right. if they met when right. they were little girls right. and they're still friends today, they had to go through their whole life story. Right. And I did this one in, um, in Manhattan, in New York, uh, fascinating story. And they got, we started in their teens, we got to about their 40s, and they both said, we can't do this, we don't want to be in the book. <gasps> and it took months. So then it was like, okay, now I've got to find a story to replace this, this. So they didn't get in? They didn't get in the book, they didn't want to be in the book. Why? Just too personal? Or? Too personal. Yeah. But you wouldn't have used Too emotional, names. too personal. And this happened to me twice. Wow. Twice. So it was very much a roller coaster ride for me, this process. Wow. But I was, I was because I think, because it, it was, to me, a very personal journey, and this was for my friend Janice, I, I couldn't bring myself to quit. Mm -hmm. I just kept saying, okay, there has to be somebody else out there. There has to be some way I can find another, I called them duos, another duo to replace this story. So, so you, there were times, Teresa, when you wanted to quit then? Oh yeah. Wow. Because I thought I'm never gonna find a good enough story to fill the pages. And then just, so you're saying three months ago you only had four. Yes. And so in the last three months you got another seven to finish the book. Well, I, I had four and I ha sort of had, and I, I had a lead on a couple stories. Okay. But I didn't have all the interviews complete. I didn't have all the pieces together. Wow. And then the seventh story, I didn't have at all. And then um, Donna came up with the idea of the eighth story being about my friend and I. That's a good idea. Wow. Yeah. And that's how did this, where did you get the seventh story? The seventh story, actually, I don't know. Before I started this process, I didn't know any of the people in this book. They're all complete strangers to me. And then one day it dawned on me that years ago um, I lived in Barrie. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked at the TV station um, CTV2, which used to be CKVR. And I met somebody at the time. She wasn't a neighbor, but she was an acquaintance of mine who lived out there who had a very interesting relationship with a woman. And I thought, I wonder if they're still friends. So I called her up 
and I was speaking to her about the book. And long story short, they are still very, very close, and their friendship took an even more interesting turn after I moved away from Barry. In fact, it's one of the best stories in this book, in my opinion. Isn't that Sto interesting? And so she was the seventh story. So her, I know, everybody else in the book were total strangers to me until I started this interview process with them. Do you have, a, do you have any short passages that you want to read to give us um, a flavor? Okay, um, I'll choose. I notice you have a lot of sticky hearts. Well, that's in there. because I've been going to different events and stuff and reading things. Okay. So um, each story begins with the person's name and location, where they're from, and then what I decided to do is take a, a quote from a well-known person to sort of capsize what their relationship was about. Mm -hmm. Um, this one is Catherine and Renee, they're from Montreal, and their quote is, life is a process, escape is not an option, and that was uh, written by Minka Kelly. So I'm just going to read a little bit about them and uh, tell you that Renee and Catherine met when they were um, in their last year of high school, and their relationship I write about up until um, their early 30s. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a little excerpt about Catherine and Renee, where Catherine is sort of the conservative and um, level-headed type. Renee is a little bit flamboyant and sometimes slightly out of control, mm -hmm. a more liberal. And mm -hmm. they are just uh, back from um, university. They are, they're on Christmas break and trying to relieve a little bit of stress. Mm. The music, the lights, and the friends. The night is magical. It feels so good to let loose after all those months of assignments and studying. It is just before 11 p.m. and Renee sees that two risers near the dance floor are full, but she really wants to show off her moves. She tries to muscle her way in, yet quickly realizes it isn't going to work out. She decides to get up on a ledge situated between two booths in the club. At first, Catherine doesn't notice, but then seconds before the incident, she sees Renee out of the corner of her eye. She stops talking to a friend and starts to focus on Renee, worried that she might fall off the thin ledge. All of a sudden, she sees Renee twirl around. Her foot flies up in the air and she kicks a girl in the face as she walks past the ledge. Catherine runs over towards the ledge. Renee is oblivious to what she has just done. As Catherine approaches, she hears a voice. It could be the boyfriend. The guy says something like, whacking that bitch that did this. Catherine looks through the crowd of people. She's yelling at Renee to get off the ledge, but Renee is either ignoring her or can't hear because the music is so loud. Catherine manages to peer over the ledge and see a guy with his arm around the girl. She's on the ground. Catherine can see blood, but can't figure out if it's coming from the girl's nose or some other part of her body. The guy stands up and he is furious, out for blood. He tries to reach through the crowd of onlookers to grab Renee's leg, but Renee is working it so hard up there, she is moving from one end of the ledge to the other. He can't grasp any body part. Catherine takes another quick look at the guy. He's huge, and he's got muscles on his muscles. <laughs> she pushes her way through a few other people and hoists herself up on the ledge so she is sitting on it. She gets an elbow in the eye from someone in the crowd, but manages to get Renee's attention. Renee, we have to get the hell out of here now, Catherine screams at her. Renee dives off the ledge, landing on her knees. She scrambles to her feet, and the two girls race out of the club. While the best friends don't get to party all night long the way they planned, they do spend the evening together. They get out in one piece and are able to laugh about it after the fact. They were still carefree back then, but life has a way of evolving. Hmm. It's going to be a pillow fight after that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but no, I want to know, does Renee feel bad for kicking a girl in the face? Um, oh my god. Actually, no. Renee's got some issues. <laughs> okay. And, and, um, now, okay, so now, from your writing this book and I guess, you know, talking to a lot of women friends, if Renee has some issues, wouldn't that mean her friend would also have some issues? Um, no. No? In this case, no. In this uh -oh. case, no, but there are, uh, there are some stories where both have issues. Um, but just not to give it away, but there's, there's stories of 
physical abuse in here. There's okay. stories of mental illness in here. Mm -hmm. There's stories of joy and birth in this book. There's all sorts of issues that I think the average woman could really relate to. There's stories of divorce, um, all sorts of stuff that wow. um, there's common struggles, but there's also some struggles that some of us would go, oh my God, how, how could you ever deal with that? Because they're not things wow. that you would deal with on a daily yeah. basis. Okay, so wow. we're just about out of time, Sounds Teresa. Sounds amazing, Teresa. But who, like really, if p people watching right now, who would really be the people that would benefit the most from getting their hands on the book? I would say anybody from teenage years to I don't know, 80 years old. It's a, wi it's a wide gamut. I you mean, know, I have some of my, my daughter's girlfriends who are t 16 years old reading this, but I have women who are 70 years old who have bought my book. And it's, it's a great gift to give a girlfriend because you often think, oh, she's got everything. Give what it to I your give best her? friend. If you're yeah. a girl, give it to your yeah. best yeah. friend, right? Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and oftentimes, you've, you, they have everything. Mm -hmm. you know, how can you get something really unique that speaks to the friendship? Mm -hmm. This would actually do that. And yeah. if you're a guy and you're struggling with what the heck women are all about, this might be the book for you as well. Girl Power Chronicles of the True Power of Female Relationships. Female Friendships, right, Teresa? Right. <laughs> Girl Power. Okay. Now, where can people go to get their um, hands They can on get it at lulu.com. It's also available on Amazon Kindle and Kobo. Oh. Uh, you're doing a, a writer circle as well? Yes. Uh, on February 17th at uh, Indigo at Bay and Bloor, I'm doing a writer circle with um, a few other authors. So come by, ask us questions, uh, get a book, and... Have a good time. Have a good time, yeah. And can they find out about that on your website or anything? Um, they or can, somewhere? Um, actually, it's not on my website currently, but it will be. In the future, in which the is when a lot of people will be watching this. But yes. when is the writer's circle happening? It's February 17th. Oh, so, okay, so it will be up by then. That, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a while So still. what's the website, your website? It's Teresa at ktmlc.com. ktmlc.com. Yeah. That's your okay. That's great. my email. Sorry, that's right. my email. My website is ktmlc.com. Great. Okay, Teresa, thanks for coming. Thank in. you. Thanks for having Good me. Luck. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So we are got. We have one more guest. Frank Wilkes is in the house from wow. Buffalo Springfield and other stuff, and he's got a new video, and we've got it right here, right now. We're gonna watch it. And come back with Frank as Liquid Lunch hits the home stretch. <laughs> Sinking in love, love, love. Sinking in love. 
just don't know that happened in the past when I was in love, sinking in love, love, sinking in love, love, sinking in love. Stand. <laughs> this is a do-it-yourself kind of guy. He's a DIYer. Well, he's, uh, You're a you know. DIYer. <laughs> <laughs> Do it yourself. And, That's and that what was I'm... Frank's song. We just saw the video yeah. of the new song, which is great. I got it. I'm singing it in my head right now, Frank. Sinking in. Are you sinking in love now? <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. That's a really good song. Thank so, you. So. Um, Frank, uh, I don't know where it's from. My uh, oh. that song is from my new album, The Freedom Express. That's why I'm here. So this album's out now, right? Yep, you can get it at cdbaby.com/slash Frank Wilkes Freedom Express. Did you give us a copy of that yet? No, but I will. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. He asks you on I mean, air. Because I, I really like that song. <laughs> I really like it. It's a great song. So are you performing anywhere um, coming up? I'm now the guitar player with the Danforth Jam Band featuring John Long from Long and McQuaid. Wow. So I'm the guitar player, um, and we're playing every Tuesday at the Duke of York at Leslie and Queen there. Every Tuesday? Every Tuesday. It's an open jam. Yeah. Can I bring my band out? You can bring your band. You can come out and take over the stage. You do whatever you want there. It's a jam. That sounds like fun, actually. Wow. So, okay, so, now, did, did you, did I see you at, you know, because John Long used to do the jam at the Black Swan, right? Yes, he's still doing that every Did you every, play every bass Saturday. with him one time? Yes. Were you playing bass? Yeah, yeah. And you played Satisfaction, didn't you? Whatever it I was. I remember that performance. <laughs> Obviously, it's memorable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I can play every instrument. When I go to jams myself, when I'm not in the jam band, I like to get up and, you know, can I play drums? Can I, you know, really Are you good on the drums, wow. though? Yeah, I'm pretty good on the drums. Yeah, that's a hard, you gotta be coordinated for that. Well, when I was a kid, I was given a set of drums, and uh, I said, nah, I don't, I don't wanna be a drummer, I wanna be a guitar player. So I gave my drums to my brother Johnny, Yeah. John Wilkes, and uh, he became a really good drummer. Wow. And, uh, but I taught him his first licks. Okay, hmm. I, uh, I know you got some songs for us. Why don't we do a song right now? Okay. Because we got you all uh, plugged in, and, and then we'll come back. I'd like to do uh, <coughs> one of the songs from my Freedom Express CD. It's all about uh, people taking care of each other. Because that's all we have, is each other. So I wrote this song. Take 
care of each other right through to the end it might be with your lover it might be with your friend cause we're all in this together whether we like it or not that's why we should care for each other cause each other is all that we've got might be with your wife you'll do it together yes we're all in this together whether we like it or not that's why we take care of each other because each other is all that we That's all that we've got. We'll make it through life, through stormy weather. You know, it might be with your wife. Yes, you'll do it together. Because we're all birds of a feather, whether we know it or not. That's why we take care of each other In this world that's a small tiny dot That's why we should care for each other Cause each other is all that we got Take care of each other Frank, that sounds so f great. Wow. That song and the, and the video and the songs, and I'm thinking it's almost like this is, uh, there's a lot of gravitas, it seems, at least to these songs that I've heard. Like, is this, uh, are, you must be very happy with this <laughs> album. Yes, I am. Like, is it like... Uh, <laughs> I think you is. I had a lot of fun recording this. Uh, we, we did most of the bed tracks in the church that my wife and I got married in. Oh, wow. Um, in now the, that uh, makes sense about the lines with the wife now. Now I get it. Yeah. Did what? you even remember that line? Yeah, of course okay. I did. Where was this church? Um, it's the Holy Trinity Church in the Guildwood. Oh, yeah. On okay. Livingston. Um, I think it's on Livingston. That's yeah. where you recorded the bed tracks? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And wow. I brought up the drummer that used to be the drummer in the Buffalo Springfield Revisited. Yeah. Um, I brought him up, Scum, Scott Lombardi from uh, Virginia. Got to have Tau, a good drummer. Tau'o, uh, Virginia. And uh, he came up for a couple of weeks and it was awesome. Yeah. You know what I really loved about your performance? Watching you play that guitar is like, it is, I'm not watching you play guitar. It felt like it was a part of your hand. The way yeah. you did that, it was such a natural, it was, you know how kids, they can type and text and, and they don't even know how to write, but they know how to text and it's like this, the instrument is like attached to their hand and it's, it's a part of their hand. That's what I felt when I was watching you play. It was, you didn't, the, it was, I don't know, it was like, it was like the guitar <laughs> played your hand instead of your hand playing the guitar. Yeah. It was really interesting to watch. Oh part of me right it, there's no question I mean that you don't always see that a lot of times you see people playing their instruments but it didn't it's feel like, my like Siamese that twin. Hmm. <laughs> wow very didn't you notice that I was really amazing well to what that. I noticed was that you really play with and I recognize this because I'm a musician myself but you yeah. really play with like it's really got that you you're hitting it the feel more than the feel but you got the steady you're just like, you're playing with authority. You're playing with gravitas, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I almost just want to hear some more music, but uh, but this album, uh, Frank, it, is it like like you know how some people they they uh, kind of like John Lennon when he came out with uh, Double Fantasy. It was like he had a lot of other stuff going on for many years, and then this was a good album, right? Is that I I I don't know. Does it feel like that to you? Like it's this a is really like really good album. It was well produced by uh, Al Duffy, and he's playing bass on it too. He's with Jack DeKaiser's band. Okay. Wow. Um, and I've got Stan Endersby on guitar. Um, um, Did you but the write songs too. The songs. Go ahead. The songs seem Angel really Mar strong. On drums on some. Angel Mar, you know Ange. Do I? No, you don't know Angel Mar. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows Angel Mar? <laughs> Call in right now. <laughs> <laughs> so when you wrote this song, all these are original songs, right? Yes. Okay, original. so did you write all the musical parts as well or did some of these I write everything. Yeah. Okay. Everything. Okay. So they're just taking your lead when when so the bass you already tell the bass what to do. Um well um my bass player was is my producer. Okay. So he actually tells us what to play. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, with me and him consulting with right, each other, okay, we okay. figure out what we want. Okay, okay. Plus, what you parts just are... we want and who's going to play it, so we get them in. And... Okay. But well, we do all the bed tracks right off the floor live. It's a way to do it. In the church, like I told you. Well, Some are done in the acoustics. studio, though. Yeah. The church has great acoustics, but most of though, them right? In the church, yeah. 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 Yeah, it well, it's, you got to get that live feel by doing the bed, at least the bed tracks live. And you've got uh, the best guy on your team when you're in a church. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> looking out for you. <laughs> yeah, she's looking out for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that look. How about they? <laughs> okay, they. That works for me. <laughs> okay, Frank, can, can you do another one for us? How many can you do for us today? Like, <laughs> As many as you want. I'm 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 the done work. Thing. I don't have to be at the jam until nine o'clock. Oh, that's tonight. Yeah, I should, I should call my guys. Yeah, tonight at the Duke. Okay, let's. Uh, Come on and dodge bullets with us. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> the Duke. That's where they had a shooting I in the know. Duke, and but it's very very nice in there now and it's pretty mellow. Does Sweet Daddy Seeky come by? Sweet Daddy Seeky. Sweet Daddy Seeky's still there, and uh, Charlie. Um, Karaoke, Charlie. <laughs> okay. They hey, got it going on there. It's, I know. It's pretty They're cool fixed bar. up the patio. Yeah. I like that place. Okay. Yeah, the patio's killer. I know. Okay. I'm winter. hanging out there next summer all the time. Okay. Maybe so what do you want me to sing? Well, something from the Freedom Express. Another one? But looks are all you see You really don't see me You cover it up Go and cover it up And take it to another place With your alien face Cover it up when you sit and you stare and Take it to another place With your alien face 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 Cover it up your alien face 
covering up now when you sit and you stare and take it to another place with your alien face 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 cover That's great. I just want to hear wow. these songs all afternoon. That was amazing. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, my, I have a friend in Newfoundland. His name is Greg Fitzpatrick from the Lords of London. Remember that band? Yeah, big Toronto band in the 60s, yeah. right? Seb was in that band too. Who? Sebastian Magnella. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, that's his favorite song from my CD. That is my favorite and that I heard. It's oh, a really it's good amazing. song. amazing. Yeah. I think that should be the next one I release to radio. Yeah, it's very good. Yes, right on the heels of a Lady Gaga, because you <laughs> yeah. know they have all these alien type songs. I think this is a really good. <laughs> have you ever seen an alien, Frank? Um, yeah. Where? Yeah. Where? Uh, illegal aliens. Oh, I've not those them. kind. You know Extraterrestrial. <laughs> he's talking about. Um, hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Probably have and don't know it. Because they're covering it up. Yeah. I'm an alien. I'm from another galaxy. So. Really? Which one? <laughs> Just one or Zuton. Zuton. Got my Zuton. Zuton. Got my Zuton. Zutonian. You're a Zutonian. I'm a Zutonian. <laughs> And we have lots of plutonium. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> okay, can we hear another song just because it sounded so good, Frank? And then we'll, uh, you know. I wrote a Christmas song. Do we even need to talk? Yeah. Want to hear a Christmas song? Sure. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everybody, by the way. Up and coming Christmas. Okay. Best in the holidays. Um, I wrote this song. Uh, I got the chord ideas and... Uh, my buddy Jamie Grant, no, John O'Grant, told me, oh, that could be a Christmas song. Yeah. So I went, hmm, that's a good idea. So that's what I wrote, a Christmas song. Christmas gets better as you're older Now you know the reason why Remember Christmas when you're younger Knew that Santa came from the sky He comes from the North Pole All over the world Bringing presents for you and me Now another year of Christmas Decorations everywhere Colors flicker in the window And the joy that we will share A child of God was born On such a Christmas day That's why we give our presents away Everybody now. La 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 la
Yes, a child of God was born on such a Christmas day. Everybody have a Merry Christmas Day. All right. Have a Merry Christmas Day. Have a Merry Christmas Day. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas Day. Awesome. And you oh. can get that on uh, cdbaby.com slash Frank Wilkes. Wow, that's fun. And on Reverb Nation, you can buy that song too. And half of the proceeds go to my sweet relief charity. What's that? For musicians that are in dire straits. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, Come on in. that's good. We got the dog. Back there too, Joe and the dog. Oh, we got a dog. Coming. Come on, pup. Hi guys. Yeah, we're on TV. This is all live. Hello. <laughs> Say hello to everybody. <laughs> so Frank, okay. So this album is out. Uh, the Freedom yes. Express. And the video that you showed is on TV now. Uh, it's been sent to much more music, uh, but they sent me an email back saying that they they can't use it. Why? Why? I don't know. They, what? They reviewed it and screened it and decided to pass on it, they said. Who are they, they to make you? such decisions? I don't decisions? know who they are. I guess you, got, you didn't pay them enough money. I don't know if they know who I think I am. They need those kickbacks. <laughs> it's all about the kickbacks. Which one did you send them? Um, this oh, one. This one. Okay. We're going to watch do, it. Do as send we go them. Out. Do get the video for Alien yeah, Face and, and, and they'll put that one on. Music sent me back an email. Yeah. I saw it, got it last night saying they're going to pass on it. So but expensive. they don't tell you why, eh? It's been sent also to uh, the country music channel, too. You know, there's, there's just... I bet you they'll use it, though. Yeah, well, I hope so, because it's a great song I and it's a great video. I hope you use it there, CMT. Please, play can we, my video. Can we use it, Frank? <laughs> can we you can use, use it, it anytime you want. Okay, all right. Well, we're going to use it right now. As right. We're going to go out, we're going to finish the show with it. And, uh, Frank, so... Like, uh, what's your website if people just want to get stay in touch with you? My website is just Wilkes, no e com. Okay. Frank, W-I-L-K-S, dot com. And you're going to be playing at the, uh, the Duke on Queen Street. I'm at the Duke tonight, and every Thursday, uh, me and John Long in the Danforth Jam with John Hutt on the bass will be playing at Wise Guys every Thursday as well. I'm Tuesdays at the Duke, Thursdays at Wise Guys, and it's an open jam. Please, musicians, come on out, bring your band with you, bring yourself, and debut yourself. I'm going to bring my band Maybe in. you can get a gig out of it. You never know. You never know. And then you'll be fabulously rich forever. Right, Frank? <laughs> well. <laughs> That's just the beginning of be the gravy train. In, in other ways than with money. Exactly. Maybe you can entertain at the FEMA camps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. And God bless everybody, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Frank. This has been awesome. Great Thank to have you, you on. Okay. Cheers. Goddess. So Goddess. Buy my CD, Frank Wilkes Freedom Express. CDbaby.com slash Frank Wilkes Freedom Express. Okay, Frank. We're going to put that up in the credits. <laughs> Don't worry about right. it. And we're going to give people another taste. I'm a salesman, taste. too, eh? So here's the song. Eh? This eh? is the first single, and, and also we're going to look forward to uh, Alien Face coming out. But here's... Mm -hmm. uh, Here's, what's this one called again? Sinking in Love. Sinking in Love. Sinking in Love. Frank Wilkes, that's it for the show today. Thanks, awesome. everybody. Awesome. Nice job. Yep. Cheers. 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 See a pig save in the Cat Shelter build this Peace weekend. Out. And put a yellow fake FEMA sticker on your mailbox. <laughs>
making it right.